Hereby I open this academic ceremony in which Mr. Reme Jorgetma will defend his academic thesis entitled International Responsibility and Attribution of Conduct, an analysis of case law on human rights and humanitarian law. Mr. Jorgetma, may I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, dear highly esteemed opponents, uh, dear members of the audience, um, authorship matters for purposes of responsibility. That could be the leitmotif of my thesis. International legal rules on the attribution of conduct determine whether a state is considered an author of certain uh, of an act of remission for the purpose of holding it responsible under international law. If conduct is attributed to the state and in violation of its international legal obligations, the state has committed an international wrongful act for which it must make full reparation. By the same token, there is no responsibility on the part of the state unless the conduct is, uh, is attributed to it. The law of state responsibility is laid down in the 2001 Articles on State Responsibility by the International Law Commission. These articles are generally considered as a representation of customary international law. The ILC, the International Law Commission, portrayed the law of state responsibility uh, as a framework of so-called secondary rules. These rules, the ILC claimed, purportedly do not address or regulate the content, interpretation or application of primary or substantive rules of international law. At the same time, the ILC articles, including its attribution rules, offer a general default regime that is applicable unless deviated from by way of a lex specialis, so special provision of international law. Now, this research analyzed the standard and function of attribution rules in the case law of human rights courts, quasi-judicial human rights bodies, and international criminal courts with jurisdiction over violations of humanitarian law. More specifically, and this was the first research question, it examined whether human rights courts on the one hand and international criminal tribunals when dealing with humanitarian law on the other have followed the standards of attribution as laid down in Articles 4 to 11 of the ILC articles, or rather whether these courts and tribunals have adopted or recognized lax specialis rules to determine whether certain conduct constitutes an act of the state. Additionally, and this is the second research question, this thesis examined whether these courts, tribunals and other bodies apply attribution rules from the law of state responsibility to determine the applicable law and to enable the exercise of their judicial function. The latter are questions of the function of attribution rules, which goes beyond wrongfulness and responsibility in the strict sense. Now, the distinction between primary substantive rules of international law and secondary rules of state responsibility was introduced in the 1960s as a method of project delimitation. On a structural level, this distinction had two major implications. First, the distinction meant that attribution and breach were uh, the only constituent elements of an internationally wrongful act. Questions of damage, intent or recklessness, etc., no longer belonged to the domain of responsibility law, but they were from then onwards considered as falling within the purview of primary rules. Second, the distinction implied that attribution rules were no longer relevant, it were no longer seen as rules that attach responsibility to a state, but rather as rules that attach 
conduct which may or may not be wrongful to a state. Um, the question, however, of the compliance with international law, whether there was a breach or not, is in principle not a question that is addressed by state responsibility law. However, as demonstrated in this thesis, uh, the International Law Commission's perception that secondary rules are wholly distinct from pr primary rules is an oversimplification. And this may not adequately reflect how international law as a legal regime operates. The fact that the primary-secondary dichotomy is untenable becomes particularly clear when the notion of international responsibility is examined against the background of international legal personality. Now, traditionally, international law was a system in which only states had rights and obligations towards other states. The modern notion of responsibility, however, extends to non-state actors who enjoy a certain measure of international legal personality that derives from the will of states. This is especially the case in the two areas of law that this thesis has focused on, namely human rights law, in which individuals have rights that can be enforced through a judicial or quasi-judicial machinery, and international humanitarian law, which impo imposes obligations on individuals, and those obligations are enforced by international criminal tribunals, uh, among others. The rules on state responsibility, as codified in the ILC articles, are for the most part geared towards solving interstate traditional uh, disputes. This thesis, however, has demonstrated that the rules on attribution of conduct are of general application and apply to all types of disputes in which the state is held responsible. Accordingly, in human rights disputes, uh, attribution rules from the ILC articles are applicable to the extent that human rights law does not provide its own lex specialis attribution rules, to which I will return in a moment. Moreover, even though the regime of international criminal law applies to individuals and not to states themselves, uh, after all, states cannot commit crimes by themselves, it is nevertheless crucial to attach conduct to states as belligerent parties in order to be able to prosecute and convict a person for crimes committed in international armed conflicts. Now, based on an extensive examination of case law of human rights courts and quasi-judicial bodies, it was shown in my research that these courts and bodies do not apply any lex specialis rules of attribution. Even in cases where human rights courts have not referred to the standards of attribution as laid down in the ILC articles by name, their examination of whether conduct amounts to an act of, the, act of the state tends to be exactly in line with, with, with what would otherwise follow pursuant to customary law. Accordingly, the attribution rules from the ILC articles have been applied in cases concerning police or security officers that exceeded their instructions, but also in other cases such as private entities exercising governmental power, as well as private conduct that has subsequently been improved and endorsed by the state as its own. In a small number of cases, human rights courts and bodies appeared to have deviated from Articles 4 to 11 of the ILC articles. Nevertheless, such deviation was only apparent, and this thesis offered further reflections on the facts and the legal, legal analysis of the case at hand. Even more exceptionally, human rights courts have recognized the legal value and relevance of the attribution rules of the ILC articles, but applied them to the facts of the case in a manner that remains open to doubt. Yet, uh, it is submitted that this is a matter of factual appreciation rather than an indication that the IDLC articles are of no value or are, are of less value. So, in light of the analysis provided in this research, it can be concluded that human rights knows no lex specialis standards on the attribution of conduct. When turning to the function of attribution rules in relation to the application of human rights law and the exercise of a court's jurisdiction over disputes involving allegations of human rights violations, this thesis focused on the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. This court has generated by now a vast body of jurisprudence on this particular topic, especially in cases where a state acts outside its own territory with the help of a non-state actor that forms an extension of the state's arm. The conceptual difference between the applicability of the European Convention and the responsibility for an act that occurs where and through whom, uh, to whom the Convention is applicable, means that a finding for a finding of whether a state has committed a human rights violation actually involves a number of dimensions. The first one is of attribution, 
Attribution rules serve to attach conduct to an actor with international legal personality, in this case, the state party to the European Convention on Human Rights. But the fact that conduct is attributable says nothing about whether such conduct was lawful or not. And this still depends on whether there's a breach of the applicable law. As shown in my thesis, the question of the breach of applicable law, so the question of whether there has been a human rights violation, actually entails two sub-questions. The first is the question about the existence of state jurisdiction in the sense of Article 1 of the Convention. If, there is a, if the state exercises jurisdiction, then the Convention as a legal regime becomes applicable. The second sub-dimension is the existence of a breach itself. So whether the conduct that is complained uh, against, whether this lives up to the rule that is applicable uh, in this particular situation. If a victim is within a state's territory, the Convention applies, and there is a presumption that it applies in full. However, the preliminary question, whether a victim is within the jurisdiction of a state acting abroad, cannot be answered without determining that the relevant conduct uh, is attributed to the state in the first place. This depends on whether a victim or territory is under the control by a person or entity whose conduct is attributed to the state as a matter of state responsibility law. The differentiation between conduct that generates jurisdiction on the one hand and conduct that generates a breach on the other hand is especially important, though not always fully appreciated, in situations concerning the extraterritorial application of a human rights treaty, where one state controls the territory of another state by way of an intermediary, for example, a puppet regime. The final chapter of my thesis turns to the standard and attribution of conduct in international humanitarian law pertaining to international armed conflicts. This body of law is adjudicated by international criminal tribunals with jurisdiction over individuals. Based on an analysis of the text of the Geneva Conventions, their object and purpose, as well as case law, it was demonstrated that the law relating to armed, international armed conflict is not applicable unless, from a legal perspective, there are two states opposing each other, and those states bear full responsibility for both the regular and the irregular forces through which they act. Given this connection between state responsibility and the existence of an international armed conflict, it is necessary to, to apply attribution rules to establish whether conduct, such as that of an organized armed group, can be attributed to a state and thereby trigger the application of the relevant rules of international humanitarian law. So if the threshold of application for international armed conflicts, such as hostile force or belligerent occupation, uh, is met as a result of acts that are attributable to a state, then the law pertaining to international armed conflict applies to that particular conduct, and any such attributable conduct in violation of the applicable law leads to state responsibility. But this equally means that an individual who is accused cannot be tried and convicted for war crimes in international armed conflict unless the situation involves two parties that fight on behalf of states as a matter of state responsibility law. This research has argued that with its specific subject matter jurisdiction and authority in the field of international humanitarian law, the criminal tribunal for the former, uh, for the former Yugoslavia was right to determine that a civil war may turn into an international armed conflict by reference to attribution rules, such as uh, attribution rules as found in the law of state responsibility. The rule that attribution uh, as per state responsibility law determines whether an organized armed group belongs to a state and thus an international armed conflict exists ensures that no responsibility gap can exist. It also accommodates the concerns of both the territorial state as well as the inter intervening state by guaranteeing that the organized group fights in fact and in law under the authority and under the responsibility of a state. At the same time, the International Court of Justice was right, it is submitted, as it implied that such rules can be found within a body of primary rules of international law, such as humanitarian law. Consequently, there is a lex specialis standard of attribution in the form of an overall control test with respect to the conduct of organized armed groups in situations in or leading up to the existence of an armed conflict.
Now, to briefly conclude, so rules on the attribution of conduct have a substantive dimension. The distinction between primary rules, uh, substantive rules, and secondary state responsibility rules as reflected and presented by the International Law Commission deserves reflection, critical scrutiny, and perhaps in light of the findings of this thesis, a little bit of refinement. Uh, the legal operation of attribution rules from the law of state responsibility, after all, it reveals that the state is considered in law as the, through, as the true actor, author of factual conduct. And this may have implications not only for the narrow question of responsibility, but the wider and preliminary questions as to the applicable law and the exercise of a court's or tribunal's jurisdiction. Now, the lack of clarity with regard to attribution rules in human rights and humanitarian law contributes to a situation in which it is unclear if and under what circumstances a state is responsible for the actions of not only its own entities and organs, but also non-state actors. Any uncertainty in this regard may be an incentive for states to resort to non-state actors at the expense of legal protection for those who are adversely affected by this conduct, which may, may be very well harmful, though not necessarily wrongful. It is my hope that the findings in this thesis will contribute to more legal certainty and ultimately to a less evasion of responsibility for conduct that is wrongful. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for your presentation. The opposition will be opened by Professor Kamiga. Professor Kamiga is Emeritus Professor of International Law at our university, and he's also the chair of the assessment committee. Dear candidates, I should begin by asking you a question about your methodology that you followed. Your thesis is essentially uh, has, has adopted an inductive approach. You have looked at the case law of uh, international human rights courts and international criminal tribunals. Um, and you are to be applauded for having included in your survey African human rights courts, which are not generally included in surveys of this type. Um, I also like the fact that you've specified the search criteria which you used to select your cases from the relevant uh, databases of international jurisprudence. But um, what I'm missing is really um, how in the end you have selected the cases that you are, have used for your, uh, for your dissertation. Um, you haven't included uh, a list of the human rights uh, courts and uh, treaty bodies that you have looked at. Mm -hmm. Um, perhaps you would find that unnecessary, but I, I, I think it should have been included, um, if only for reasons of, of clear methodology. You have a table of cases, of course, which indicates uh, which cases you have used, and that's fair enough, but uh, that doesn't indicate which, in which uh, human rights courts you did not find relevant cases mm -hmm. and why. Uh, and most importantly, uh, with regard to international criminal tribunals, uh, you are really uh, uh, very summary in your choices because you say in one of your footnotes that the term criminal tribunals refers exclusively to the ICTY and the International Criminal Court. In the footnote you say that. Um, but you don't explain in the body of the text why, uh, why you, you have decided that the other international criminal tribunals are not relevant. Is it because you didn't find any relevant uh, cases there, mm -hmm. or did you run out of time, mm -hmm. or was the database uh, incomplete? Uh, so could you please explain to me uh, how you've approached this question of forum choice in your methodology? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, so let me start first with the human rights case selection. Um, I took as a point of departure the um, report, the triennial report of the UN Secretary General, um, the report gives an overview of the cases uh, and the courts which have applied, adopted, or otherwise engaged in a meaningful manner with the ILC articles on state responsibility. And there is another report that tabulates it by article. So it was quite clear from, from, uh, from, from my understanding of the reports that the cases or the courts that I have engaged with were the only human rights courts that have pronounced on matters of state responsibility and particularly 
the situation or the questions of attribution. Um, so that that was leading for for me the 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 methodology follows from the research question. The research question was now how do how does the case law of human rights courts and criminal tribunals deal with the attribution articles? Are there perhaps special provisions? So the body of case law, that was my point of departure. And it was those courts that I've identified that, that actually said something about attribution of conduct in a manner that was meaningful and that would allow for some kind of an academic reflection. Um, admittedly, in, many, in, in a great number of cases, human rights courts do not adequately or sufficiently um, analyze the question of attribution because very often it's given, it's, it's taken as a given. If a police officer does something, then it is very rare for a tribunal to engage in an attribution analysis because a police officer is, of course, an organ of the state. Um, so the courts that I have identified, they were the only ones that that did engage in, in some kind of a meaningful matter with, uh, with attribution questions. Uh, now the question, uh, turning to the criminal tribunals, um, it, is, it is very correct that I only focus on two uh, tribunals, the, the ICTY of the Yugoslavia Tribunal and the International Criminal Court. Um, I wanted, and I should have perhaps um, reflected a bit more clearly on that in the introductory chapter, I wanted to limit it to international criminal tribunals in the proper sense, no hybrid tribunals, because hybrid tribunals often pose delicate questions of a mix between applicable international law and domestic law, and that would create an, an additional methodological difficulty that would sort of obscure or skew my, my findings in, in a manner that would overly complicate it. Um, the ICTR, the Tribunal for Rwanda, doesn't have jurisdiction over international armed conflicts, so that 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 that's that sort of um, makes it makes it of little use to engage with their case law if my question is about the role of attribution rules in classifying a situation of armed co conflict as, a, as, as an international one. So that, that would mean that I only had uh, the ICTY and the ICC left. Uh, it was by necessary implication, I would almost say, in, in a way that followed from, the, from my research question. Hmm. But can I ask one, one quick follow-up question on, on the human rights courts? You decided you decided to follow the findings of the UN report mm -hmm. on this. Yeah. Um, but you also criticized the UN report, I think, at some point in your in your thesis for being incomplete, for having missed cases. Yeah. So uh, how do you explain this? Yeah. No, I took um, it's a, I took the, the report of the Secretary General as an initial point of departure. It gave me a good impression of the relative distribution. It was very obvious from the report, for example, that trade law and investment law, that they engage a lot with attribution articles. But uh, I, I wanted to leave it out of my thesis because a lot has been written about this already. Um, and then turning to the Human Rights Court and the criminal tribunals, um, from the numbers, the, the, the number of incidences that a court refers to attribution rules, it, it, it gave me a very clear impression that it's mostly the European Court of Human Rights. And what was a little bit surprising to me, the East African Court of Justice and the ECOWAS Community Court of Justice, that they were the most active in engaging with attribution articles. Um, to, of course, make sure that I don't overlook cases, I used the search engines of all the of all the courts. So HUDOC, for example, for the European Court of Human Rights, uh, the African Human Rights System doesn't have a very useful uh, search database. So that's why I used uh, the digest of um, that was published by, by private actors. And I, I checked, um, I searched for words like attribution, responsibility, international law commission with different variations and uh, Boolean searches in order to find the cases that were not included in the Secretary General's report. And I have to admit that one of the most exciting cases for me is the, the Univers Universal Trade Center uh, case versus Rwanda. That was a case that was not included in the Secretary General's report, which is, which is a very unfortunate shortcoming because it was an extremely interesting case with an extremely elaborate analysis of um, attribution for state organs, uh, um, other private entities that are exercising governmental authority, as well as the distinction between primary and secondary rules. So I agree that the, the report only provided, let's say, the tip of the iceberg, but it did give, it did point me in the right direction and further sources and cases were found through the databases and the, and the different journals. One th thing to, to quickly jump on, 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 uh, on the human rights bodies, I checked 
all the human rights bodies, so the treaty-based bodies, all the general comments, all the case law. So all of them are included. But as you, uh, as one can read in the thesis, the the output of those bodies is not um, very substantial when it comes to uh, matters of attribution and state responsibility. Yeah. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor Louis Fabry, who is uh, director at the Max Planck Institute for International Procedural Law in Luxembourg and also a member of the assessment committee. And Professor Ruiz Fabri is joining us online today for this ceremony, and I would like to welcome her very much to Maastricht University today. <coughs> very good to have you. And Professor, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I would like to say how pleased I'm to be uh, with you, if only or, or online. Remy, I apologize for that. But uh, for me, it's a matter of great satisfaction to see you defend your thesis uh, today, uh, that you have completed this work uh, that you wrote mostly when you were at the uh, Institute. And uh, completing such a work is already a, a, a great uh, achievement. Uh, I would like to, to ask questions in, uh, in relation to issues which are close to my, to my heart. You said when you make your presentation, uh, that the distinction between primary rules and secondary rules was untenable. And so it echoes some developments you have in your uh, thesis. And um, attribution, I mean, uh, is uh, typically this kind of rule which seems to, 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 to go over the, the, the categorization that uh, lawyers are used to doing. You, you put it in new, one of your uh, propositions, the fact that um, uh, lawyers tend to, to go into categorical thinking. Uh, at the same time, um, I would like to ask whether this, uh, uh, the, this uh, um, rule of attribution, uh, whether it is a substantive or a procedural rule. Uh, so you said in your presentation that it was mostly a substantive rule, but at the same time, we can see that it can play a procedural uh, role especially at the jurisdictional level. So would you say that it can also be a procedural rule or whether the distinction between substantive and procedural is untenable like primary and secondary uh, is? Uh, I would like to have your thoughts on, uh, on that. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, let me first start by maybe perhaps explaining a little bit more how I see the distinction between primary and secondary. I mentioned in my presentation and as well in the thesis that I find it in principle untenable, but at the same time, there's a certain value to sticking to the, theory, to, to the, to the distinction as long as we don't present this distinction as absolutely watertight. So um, I, I do think that at least part two and part three of the ILC articles on state responsibility, they're secondary in their own way, because these are the consequences and the implementation and the invocation that applies uh, after the wrongful act has occurred. On the other hand, the rules in part one, so attribution and breach, uh, they are, they, I, I still see them secondary because they are of course related to, to wrongfulness and responsibility, but I don't see them as strictly separate clinically isolated from um, the primary rules of international law, which if violated, give rise to state responsibility. And it is at this point where I depart from the position of the International Law Commission. So while subscribing to the primary secondary terminology to a certain point, and especially for certain parts of the ILC articles, I reject that uh, clear distinction when it comes to part one, uh, more specifically the rules on attribution and breach. Um, I would I would probably side with 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 a number of authors that I that I um, um, that I refer to in chapter one and chapter three, who say that these attribution rules they have a substantive dimension because they identify they define in the absence of a lex specialis the the category of um, of actors through whom the state acts potentially in breach of the law. Um, so, for example, it is often said that a state cannot enforce its jurisdiction abroad. It cannot enter the territory of another state through its armed forces, 
But I would submit that the same rule applies to incursions in another state's territory by private entities who are under the direction or control of a state. So that's an example of a primary rule, a substantive rule, whose outer contours, if you will, are defined by the attribution articles uh, in the ILC articles, which apply, of course, unless there is a lex specialis uh, provision. Now, turning to your question about the distinction between substantive and procedural law, that's, that's quite likely another distinction that I have some disagreements or some problems with. I find the distinction, again, only useful as a starting point, uh, but it can never be as clear as, for example, the international law, uh, it is, sorry, the International Court of Justice wants us to believe, because here again, uh, the court presents it as two categories of rules that are completely distinct and do not influence in any way, shape or form. Um, in one of the footnotes, I mentioned uh, Democratic Republic uh, of the Congo versus Rwanda case, the armed activity case, where, where the court said, well, a reservation to the, ge to the genocide treaty, that's a, that's a procedural uh, question and it doesn't affect compliance with the substantive rules. That, that may very well be true, but that doesn't imply necessarily that those rules are categorically distinct. And I think if I may add one example of uh, an, an area of international re legal regulation where the scope and the application of procedural rules is affected very much by substantive questions is in the area of functional immunity of uh, lower ranking state officials. There, the general consensus at least seems to be growing at the moment, also within the International Law Commission, that a lower ranking state official doesn't enjoy functional immunities when he or she commits international crimes. So there you, that, that would be an example of a situation in which the substantive behavior does affect the scope of the procedural immunities, and immunities are procedural. Um, so in that sense, again, the distinction is probably not as black and white as is um, presented to us for the sake of simplicity or for the sake of, um, yeah, let's, I, I, I think I'm gonna leave it to that. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So can I ask you, Professor Ruiz Fabri, whether you are satisfied with the answer? Yes, I'm satisfied with the answer. Oh, this, I may have all and it's fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. In that case, we uh, continue the opposition, um, and the opposition will be continued by uh, Professor uh, Donders. Professor Donders is Professor of International Human Rights and Cultural Diversity at the Universiteit van Amsterdam. She's also a member of the assessment committee, and I welcome her very much back to Maastricht. Thank you very much, Chair. Indeed, it's great to be back. I was where you stand about 20 years ago, defending my thesis in the same room. So it uh, brings back lots of good memories. So let me first of all join my colleagues in congratulating you on this, on this work, on this work done, on uh, also the way you've presented it today to us. Now, I think indeed the topic of your dissertation is crucial because there's been a lot of debate to what extent the classical principles and rules of state responsibility are actually suitable to apply in certain fields of international law that are not characterized by a mere interstate relationship. And human rights law is of course one of those fields. And my question therefore relates to the relevance of your dissertation, as you claim also for victims of alleged human rights violations. Because while you convincingly show that the strict distinction, and it was also just discussed, between primary rules of international law and secondary rules on state responsibility is no longer tenable, it is to me less clear whether you find this a good development or not. In your conclusion, you state that, and I quote you, it's in the interest of legal certainty and potential or actual victims to acknowledge that the attribution rules from the law of state responsibility have a substantive and procedural dimension in human rights law and IHL. So very last sentence, I think, of your conclusion on page 230. However, while this may have been more clear by your dissertation, how does this help victims of alleged human rights violations? Is this not mostly for their lawyers preparing those cases? Are victims going to understand 
any of this kind of technical stuff on the law of state responsibility. Does the fact that attribution rules are relevant for both the determination of applicable law as well as for state responsibility give them something? In other words, what is your more normative standpoint on this? Is this a good way to go? Should perhaps the rules, the articles on state responsibility be adjusted to reflect these developments? And I would in this case also like to point at proposition number eight, which says understanding the substantive and practical importance of rules that connect conduct to a state as an international legal person will benefit victims seeking remedy for incurred harm. How does that work in practice? I look forward to your answer. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, from the outset, I have to admit that wherever I wrote victim might perhaps more properly have been written uh, a victim and their legal representation. Uh, it is after all the legal representatives that, that in most cases take the case to uh, let's say the Euro European Court of Human Rights and cases cannot proceed after the communication without legal representation. So at the end of the day, there's always gonna be a lawyer involved or an advocate. Uh, and in that sense, yeah, maybe in order to dramatize it a little bit, I wanted to focus on the victims, not so much the, the formalistic legal representation that, that, uh, they, that um, they are accompanied by. Um, now, I, 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 let's turn to, to one of your questions was whether the ILC article should be adapted to, to change uh, or to reflect, uh, for example, the, the increased participation of non-state actors, uh, especially within the field of human rights law. I do think so, because um, theoretically speaking, there's only one part of the ILC articles that apply to these types of mixed disputes, and that's part one. That's, that's the articles and attribution, the definition of a wrongful act, the fact that there needs to be uh, the two elements, and then what constitutes a breach in a very tautological manner. And, and that's it. So all the provisions on content and implementation and countermeasures and reparation, all of that is not applicable to human rights disputes. Uh, and that follows from, from Article 33, Paragraph 2, and a footnote. Uh, it doesn't even follow very clearly from the text of the articles in themselves. Um, it is my impression that the ILC has very much struggled with this. The first special rapporteur, he wanted to produce a, a body of human rights law for foreign investors. And the law, the International Law Commission has for a long time struggled to get rid of that. Now, the distinction between primary and secondary rules as adopted in the 1960s was their way out, was a genius move by which they could avoid all these substantive questions. And I think because of that, because of the weight that fell off their shoulder by letting go the substantive treatment of foreigners, it made it very difficult, if not completely impossible, for the International Law Commission to, to return again, uh, to, to come back basically in a full circle and address again those uh, substantive norms. Even the substantive secondary norms on what, what constitutes reparation, what is uh, compound interest, is that included? Who may invoke responsibility? Are there injured victims, but also, are there perhaps also non-injured victims in the same way that we have uh, uh, the distinction between uh, injured states and non-injured states. So yes, it is probably an area that would deserve more um, precision. And I would be completely in favor of an ILC articles that do adopt the perspective of of victims and do acknowledge the fact that victims can invoke it, can implement it, and are, are then entitled to a certain uh, package of reparation. Um, but realistically, I, I just don't see it happen. Uh, so that, that may be a little bit of wishful thinking. I do think it would be beneficial for victims and, and, and their legal representation, um, but I find it very unlikely that it will happen uh, anytime soon. Um, Turning to your second, I'm taking it in a slightly different order, I hope you permit. Um, how does this help victims in human rights cases? If let's say we're let's say we're talking about a reasonably informed victim or a lawyer, and and that lawyer would look at Bosnian genocide and would read how the ICJ perceives the distinction, where the the International Court of Justice says very clearly. This, is, this falls to the body of substantive rules, and this falls to the body of secondary rules, and there is no interaction. That lawyer would probably be more inclined to look at the attribution rules in order to argue that a substantive rule has been violated. Uh, 
having in the back of his or her mind the categorical distinction between these two types of rules. So that's why I stress a number of times, to, to the point perhaps of, of annoying repetition, that these attribution rules, that they have a substantive dimension because they identify in an exhaustive manner, unless there is a lex specialis, the type and range of actors through whom the state can violate, for example, its human rights obligations. Um, so that is one thing in which these the conclusions of my thesis and, and also the, the more welcome reception of the attribution rules could be beneficial to victims. Uh, and the second reason, and there's only one case that I refer to it, uh, Chikanovic, um, where the court uses attribution rules in order to um, not, not so much to attribute the, the alleged wrongful conduct to the state, but to uh, interpret a substantive provision. In this case, it was the provision that you cannot expect from an individual to start enforcement proceedings against the state when you already have a judgment. So, and here the court said, uh, well, if, if this applies to to the, let's say, the apex authorities, uh, the central government, and then we see no reason uh, why this would not apply to lower organs as well. So this is another example where um, resort, uh, embracing even the attribution rules have has led to a situation in, in which it was able and possible for the victim to obtain uh, redress for the violations incurred. Yeah. On the other hand, we've also seen cases, and I think Makuchian and Minusian versus Hungary and Azerbaijan is, 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 is one of my favorite examples where the court applies and interprets the articles on, on responsibility and the attribution articles so extremely strict that it almost becomes impossible for the victim to invoke them successfully. But well, you, you, you can't have it all, all, all the time. So. The opposition will be continued by Professor Leimsaat, who is Professor of International Law at our university and also a member of the Assessment Committee. And before I give her the floor, I have to ask the candidate to, when you start answering uh, the question, to also properly address the opponent in the right way. Yes, thank you. I give the floor to Professor Leimsaat. Thank you, dear candidate. Um, my congratulations on an interesting and very readable book which demonstrates your broad knowledge of the subjects and it includes your views and opinions and uh, true to form sometimes your opinions are quite clear i like that personally um, so it was a pleasure to read and i'm very happy to discuss uh, the book today uh, with you i liked chapter Two, on the development and history of the concept of state responsibility and the role of the ILC in the development of the, the articles or the RCWA, whatever we call them. Sometimes we get confused and they are still called the draft articles, but I think they have been truly developed and finalized by now. Now, um, you mostly focus on the role of two out of five special rapporteurs that wrote about the subject. You are quite critical uh, about the work of special, uh, rep um, special is a representative? No, it's not. Special rapporteur, I'm, I'm getting confused, sorry. Special rapporteur Garcia Amador, he's in the wrong corner as, as far as you are concerned. And you more or less agree with the direction taken by Special Rapporteur Argo, who strengthened the role of this primary secondary rules idea. The ILC project took a long, long time, almost 50 years. And it has been a core item on the ILC's working list for a long time. In those 50 years, five special rapporteurs took the lead in the ILC discussions. So it was Garcia Amador, Ago, Repagen, a Dutchman, and the legal advisor of the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Arango, Arangio Ruiz, and then James Crawford. Since the conclusion of the project, I think we all turn to Crawford's purple book as the entry point uh, on the law of state responsibility. Now, 
um, re-reading that chapter two, it dawned on me that you don't seem to discuss anything done by Ripage, he's a fellow Dutchman, or Arangio Ruiz. Why did they not address the question of attribution? Why did you not mention them and single out the two initial rapporteurs, Garcia Amador, I think also to distinguish from his line of thought, which mm -hmm. was eventually not the line of thought that uh, became the heart of the work of the ILC and Argo because he structured the debate, I think. But why not address the work of Ripage, Arangio, Arangio Ruiz, or even Crawford? Um, that makes me focus on the thinking. You, you take us to focus on the thinking of those two special rapporteurs who are undoubtedly important as their reports shape the discussion in the ILC. Without solid reports, no progress is made in the ILC. However, and these are my questions, why focus on the reports alone? The special rapporteur is not a pars pro toto for the ILCs, only one of the, what is it, 34 members of the ILC. Uh, and it makes it look as though the debate in the ILC about these reports was somehow of lesser relevance. Um, and so what has been the role of the other ILC members in these debates? It is, after all, not the special rapporteur who determines the end result. Thank you. Highly esteemed opponent, dear Professor George Leinsaat, um, thank you for your question. Um, to address your first question first, um, I only focused on the reports of the first, second and the fifth special rapporteur, especially the first two, um, because this is in, in, in that time frame, that's where the genesis of the distinction comes from between primary and secondary, 1960s. That's also where the constituent elements of an internationally wrongful act come from, which is which was already done by the first special rapporteur who, deser who, should, who deserves a little bit more honor perhaps than can be gleaned from, from my, my thesis. Um, because after some reflection, he, he, he did have an epiphany and, and did formulate the uh, breach and attribution as the constituent elements. Now, the third and the fourth special rapporteur, I, I went through their reports, I went through the process for Baal and, and the, the, the yearly reports to the, uh, uh, to the General Assembly, um, but there was nothing of interest for the question that I was looking at. So what, what these special rapporteurs have mostly dealt with were, were questions such as a dispute settlement provision, uh, whether the ILC article should have a separate um, um, mechanism devoted to uh, the settlement of dispute arising out of state responsibility question, perhaps with a compromissory clause, giving jurisdiction to the ICJ. Uh, and of course, the endless debate and what seemed like an endless debate when going through materials, at least, was the whole discussion of international crimes, which was, of course, at the end rejected because it was so controversial. Uh, perhaps without the international crimes uh, provision, I, I could have well, this, this thesis might have been able to be written already 10 years ago because we might have had the articles 10 years earlier. Um, so so with, with all due respect to the third and the fourth special rapporteur, I, I did not come across anything that I found of relevance for uh, particularly the constituent elements and the distinction between primary and secondary, um, because that, that, that's, that's really where, where Ago and, and, uh, and the first special rapporteur are, were the most uh, influential. Um, I think there, there's an aspect of your question that I have not addressed yet. I'm sorry. Yes, I, I asked why are you only I, focusing yeah. on the role and the reports of yeah. the special rapporteurs? Because there's more people in the International Law Commission. Yes. The debates, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I did try to explain it. Um, perhaps I should have done a bit of a better explanation in Chapter 1 where I spend a considerable amount of pages on discussing and justifying the, the number and the type of sources that I engage with, um, and which for me, for the International Law Commission, was not just the reports. Indeed, the reports, they, they provide sort of the intellectual feeding ground, which is then discussed in the plenary, and then all the realism uh, comes into play and everything is watered down and compromised. 
Um, but in order to, to understand the process of how norms change within the International Law Commission, I went from the first draft to all the discussions, all the process for BAL, drafting committee reports, because sometimes in the drafting committee reports, very substantial, important changes are introduced. Um, so while perhaps my thesis gave the impression that I focus predominantly on the reports, I use those reports to, to pinpoint the, the, the genesis, let's say, of certain concepts. And I do refer to observations in the plenary discussion, um, sometimes in the text, often in the footnotes, but I might have spent a bit more attention on those to avoid the impression that the ILC is just one rapporteur or even five successive rapporteurs, because that's, that's, uh, that's of course not the case. It's, it's a body of collective decision making. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, but at the end, it's a product of the commission itself and not of the reporter. Yes, I, 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 uh, I admit, yes. Then I'm going to uh, allow the chair of the assessment committee, Professor Kamiga, to raise a second question. Uh, dear candidates, your manuscript was concluded almost a year ago, at the end of last year. And of course, you weren't able to take into account subsequent case law. Uh, I would like to ask you about a subsequent case, namely uh, Georgia versus Russia, that was adopted by the European Court of Human Rights in January of this year. So after the conclusion of your thesis, fair enough, you, you even referred to it in a footnote that it was coming. Um, now we know what it is. Um, and uh, let me just summarize it, that the court decided in that case that um, conduct during the active phase of hostilities in Georgia, Russian troops invading Georgia during the active phase of hostilities, that conduct by Russia and its, and its uh, subsidiary forces was not within the jurisdiction of the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, this caused quite an, a lot of surprise in the, in the literature. I would ask you to comment on this judgment and particularly to ask you whether you should revise your thesis uh, in the light of this judgment if, uh, if a published version is, is coming out. And I would avi advise you to be diplomatic because you're talking now about your employer uh, who adopted this decision. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, highly esteemed opponent. And thank you also for the reminder that this, um, Georgia versus Russia, um, but also a case against Germany, Hanan versus Germany, and a decision in the conflict between Ukraine and Russia. Those are three major cases that that um, that do actually contribute something new to the body of case law. Now, if we look at Georgia uh, versus Russia, this 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 statement that in the active phase of hostilities there is no jurisdiction, of course, has attracted um, to some extent understandable criticism. Um, and this is something that would have to be reflected on if there is going to be, uh, for the commercial version of this thesis. Now, of course, the human rights minded people would, would criticize this and say, no, this is, this is horrible, this is wrong. Uh, the court should have found jurisdiction and then you can, you can measure state behavior uh, according to the lines of what the convention sets in, in, in terms of substance, substantive law. But what is overlooked and the court does give an indication that this was in the back of their mind is that a human rights court is perhaps not the most ideal or appropriate forum to deal with questions of IHL. Um, IHL being a very different regime with different underlying values. It's not just about human dignity, even though sometimes uh, it's, it's perceived as such, but it tries to form a, a, an effective and realistic balance between military and huma humanitarian considerations. And this makes it already very difficult and different from human rights law, because at the end of the day, human rights law turns around the human dignity and the protection of the individual. Um, and the court has hinted at the fact that it might be willing to step into these matters on a more pronounced level if states are willing to grant this power to the court. For example, by way of the conclusion of a separate protocol could be an optional protocol, could be a compulsory protocol. And this would give the court arguably more legitimacy to deal with questions of IHL, humanitarian law, and would 
likely also embolden the court to to find um, violations even in the active phase of hostilities. Whereas right now the court is reluctant to engage with that particular time frame uh, that, that in the active phase of hostilities time frame because of not just the fog of war, the fact that the, the, the facts were, were not completely clear. It is also very difficult, of course, to do any fact finding in, in armed conflict uh, situations. And on top of that, IHL is not within their core mandate. Um, and so, and perhaps the court has been reluctant to find jurisdiction in the active phase of hostilities stage because it perhaps feared that it would detract from its legitimacy. It would create perhaps another backlash. Uh, we've already, there, there have already been a few backlashes against the court when, when a certain state receives a judgment that is not to their pleasing. Um, so perhaps that's a little bit of a conservatism on the part of the court that didn't benefit the victims of those hostilities, but at the same time, we have to ask ourselves, is it worth to overstep potentially the boundaries of what is without a doubt within the court's jurisdictional competence? I believe that questions of IHL um, are probably not best off in a human rights court. That's a very disappointing uh, conclusion because we've always taught our students that human rights law is also applicable uh, during armed conflict, haven't we? Uh, and if the court is now suggesting no, but it's too complicated, so we can't get into this. Although they sent a uh, investigative mission to Georgia to, mm. to, to gather evidence on the spot, it's too, too complicated. That means that you leave the most serious violations outside the scope of the uh, European Convention on Human Rights. Would you find that satisfactory? Satisfactory? No, from the from the victim's point of view, perhaps not. But um, if there's a legitimacy crisis and states withdraw, and there's already, for example, the United Kingdom might withdraw because of Hearst and the prisoners voting. The Euro Russia is, of course, already uh, um, thinking of withdrawal, and they have uh, introduced constitutional legislation that that enables uh, it to. Uh, ignore the court, that is the type of backlash that is probably also not very be beneficial for victims in the long run. So I, I would, my, my personal and um, professional uh, academic preference would not be to include all of this a priori from the scope of the court. Ideally, I would like that, that states um, signal in a certain way that they're willing that the court entertains these matters. And I think a protocol is a very elegant solution I would ideally prefer an optional protocol, um, would be a very elegant solution that um, excludes as much as possible doubts that, uh, that can be cast on the legitimacy of the court. Um, the discussion will now be continued by Professor Roes Fabry. Thank you very much. Uh, following of, uh, of the question which has uh, just been asked, I, was, I have been wondering uh, when reading your, your thesis about the possibility to, to extend the analysis you make regarding human rights and humanitarian law to other fields of law, as I mentioned, uh, investment law. I don't know whether you gave it a thought regarding arbitration and whether you couldn't find exactly the same issues as the one you have just raised regarding the extension to international humanitarian law and some kinds of uh, conflicts. Uh, thank you, a highly esteemed opponent, uh, Professor Ruiz Fabri. Um, I started off by looking in investment law and trade law. And I, I put a very decent effort in trying to understand the cases. Um, but I have to admit from the outset that international economic law is not my field of law. It doesn't excite me. I, I lack the expertise or the understanding. And I thought it would be too risky to test the validity of my hypothesis and whether there is a distinction between primary and secondary rules and whether courts employ a lack specialist test of attribution, I would find it too risky 
and I probably would have spent a couple of more years um, if I had ventured into, into international investment and trade law. Um, to sort of answer your question in a very superficial manner, uh, I believe that <laughs> my time is up. You may briefly conclude your reply. Thank you, thank you. Um, it, it is my impression that investment tribunals are much more receptive towards the attribution articles, that they're much less likely to recognize or identify or apply lex specialis, whereas world trade law in the dispute settlement body and the appellate body, um, there's a, a perception that trade law is clinically isolated from public international law to a large extent. And in trade law, we see that when it comes to the interpretation of the word measure or state, it is often interpreted on the basis of its own case law without necessarily relying in a decisive manner uh, on the ILC articles of state responsibility. Though the articles may be invoked to support a conclusion that has already been made based on own case law. Mr. Joritsma, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The decree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. I request that you and your company, both here and online, await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. Thank you.
Mr. Joritma, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taken into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Yes. Professor, <laughs> Professor Wittmer and Muller are authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. And I now invite your supervisors to take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times? Please use the microphone. Uh, do you promise? to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible. I do. By the authority vested in us by law and in, in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Remy Joritsma, cum laude, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. Dr. Yoritsma, or better, cum laude, Dr. Yoritsma. <laughs> Seven years ago, you were a docent in our faculty, and I had just arrived here as a new professor. You told me that you would like to embark on a PhD, but the world at the time was just slowly recovering from the financial crisis Yes, remember that crisis <laughs> when the buzzword was, was austerity rather than printing money. And funding was thus very scarce and uncertain. So we were teaching our students together and keeping our eyes open for PhD opportunities. I very quickly realized how immensely talented you were for legal argumentation and law teaching. Your talent was already recognized by my predecessor, so my job was easy in a way. You already were here, your talent had already been spotted. We only had to make sure that your career would develop progress the way it should. You were indeed one of the most highly rated teachers in our faculty and tremendously respected by our students. You were also highly successfully coaching our moot court team in international humanitarian law. And it was in this context when I once received a highly remarkable email from one of our students. It was so remarkable that I saved it so that I can quote it on special occasions like today. <laughs> 
the student said, hey, Yura, I applied for IHL Moot. Do you have any tips on how I could impress Professor Yoritzma? And I read my email. <laughs> I said to myself, wait, he's Professor Yoritzma. And I'm, hey, Yura. So what is he doing right? And what am I doing wrong? But with you, Remy, it always seemed that when it comes to the substance, when it comes to legal argumentation and to teaching, it always seemed, it, it always seemed that the knowledge and the authority you had was already well beyond the PhD. It was only a question of whether or not we would be able to find the right place for you. And then the opportunity came at the Max Planck Institute for Procedure Law in Luxembourg, no less. You were hired to work partially on your PhD, partially on some institute projects, including the highly acclaimed Max Planck Encyclopedia. And I think that we both agree that without this opportunity, we probably wouldn't be here um, today. But also quite importantly, the Institute did not only provide you with the necessary um, support, financial support to, to, to uh, complete your studies, you also became a member of a group of very talented scholars. And this is where you grew academically. I could see your growth at every successive meeting that we, have, that we had during the PhD process. But the story of your PhD was not so straightforward. It's not quite as simple. Remy then goes to Luxembourg and then returns with a thesis to Maastricht. Um, and to, to explain why, I will now return a little bit to the times when you were still teaching here. I already mentioned the tremendous respect you had among our students, but you did not win that respect by being lenient. Actually, you won your respect by being tough. And one of the most common descriptions I heard of you, of you from our students was, Remy is tough, but fair. And I think this is what describes you rather well. Tough, but fair. And you could be tough, but, but fair even on me. But the toughest you could be on yourself. Indeed, sometimes so tough that it was even unfair. And I think this is the reason why the road of your PhD from Luxembourg to Maastricht was maybe a little windier than it should have been. You were sometimes just too tough on yourself. But in the end, your thesis did not come here from Luxembourg, it came from Strasbourg. Why and how did this happen? Well, we need to look at the broader picture again. In fact, when you worked in Luxembourg, you actually lived in Arlon, right across the border in Belgium. And that's why it seems to me that as a good international lawyer, you always need to live somewhere close to a border. Uh, from Herle, you move to Maastricht, from Maastricht to Arlon. And then you briefly worked a little bit in Leiden, but then in the absence of any border, at the end of city premises, that was not really your cup of tea. So you moved to Strasbourg. And this is where you got back on your working temperature, right next to yet another border, you completed your Meisterwerk. But to be sure, Remy, our meetings and exchanges, as tough as they could sometimes be, could also be a lot of fun. There were quite a few anecdotes that we developed 
in this years. And there was my constant preaching to you about smoking being very bad for you. Um, after all, only some kilometers from here, I would be called your doc doctor father. So I assumed uh, some kind of parenting responsibilities, I suppose. And then there were your constant complaints about my really awful handwriting. Um, and on one occasion, you told me, you write like a doctor, to which you added, I mean, like a real doctor, <laughs> thus implying that a doctor of law is not really a doctor. Today is not the right occasion to return this kindness. So I will say that now you are a doctor. And as far as I'm concerned, and hopefully also you, a very real one. And me, as proud as I am to have been the first person to have legitimately called you Dr. Joritzman, I'm actually even prouder that have, after seven years of annoying you in one capacity or another, we will be able to leave this room, I'll shake your hand or bump your elbow these days, and I'll be able to call you my dear friend, Remy. But now, while I'm still acting as your promoter, I only need to say, well done, doctor, real doctor, cum laude, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Dr. Joritsma, also on behalf of the University and the Faculty of Law, many congratulations on the degree that you just acquired, the third degree at this university, also the highest one that we uh, have available here. Many congratulations on that, and also many congratulations to your family and friends, both here and watching this ceremony uh, online. Um, I also note how enthusiastic your audience here was during the ceremony, with applauding you uh, at several uh, occasions. Um, now, um, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Ruiz Fabri, who joined us online for this ceremony. Many thanks for being here uh, during this uh, uh, um, well exceptional uh, defense uh, ceremony. Um, I'm going to close this ceremony, but I still have a few practical remarks. And my first practical remark is that it's allowed again to have a reception. I'm very happy that we will have one here in this building, in the rafter. Um, and I want to ask the uh, audience to already go there while we are going to take a photo with the young doctor on the stairs um, of, this, uh, of this building. I have to ask you though to use a face mask when you are going to the, uh, uh, to the rafter. That's the, the first uh, uh, remark uh, that, I, uh, um, that I have. And I actually want to end with congratulating you again um, and also your family and friends on this uh, very special degree. And with this, I close this academic ceremony. <laughs>